All right, hey you guys, John Britt here. Hey, I am going to do a video today. It's gonna to be on uh, slips. And I have a, a whole board here of all the stuff that I'm talking about. It's gonna be uh, a description, really a line blend of Kalen and Nefsi. And so I'm gonna show ways that you can use this idea to understand uh, slips better okay so <laughs> i did this video uh, many times and i'm trying to improve it uh, what i discovered was for beginners i use a lot of terms that i uh, assume you know and when i have a glaze class i will this will be like the third day so we will have talked about many many things uh, but that's not the case if you just turn the video on. So I have some little um, things I'm going to hold up and explain some definitions first. Uh, just so you know, I have a whole series of uh, glaze talks on this channel, which I call like free online glaze course. So you can watch some of those. That might help you get into the swing of this. Um, okay, so... This is a combination of a video, which normally are edited. This is unedited. Uh, and it's a uh, kind of a PowerPoint without being a PowerPoint, because I hate PowerPoints. But also it's like, uh, I don't know if you remember Ross Perot, the giant sucking sound of gla glazes going to Mexico. Uh, he held up charts. And so I'm going to hold these up and explain to you what terms I'm going to talk about today. One of the main terms I'm going to talk about today is greenware and bisqueware. So greenware includes everything that's unfired. So it's wet clay, leather hard, bone dry. And that has a very high shrinkage. It's like 12 to 15 percent, especially for throwing bodies. It's less for sculpture bodies. And then the other concept is going to be bisqueware, which is fired clay, and it has very low shrinkage. So these two concepts are going to be important. So anytime I say, you know, greenware, I may specify leather hard or wet or um, bone dry, because there are different ways you can apply slip to your glaze. All right, the next concept will be... Uh, high shrinkage here for kaolin and and anytime i'm talking about kaolin or clay i could be talking about ball clay fire clay bentonite stoneware clay earthenware clay those all have high shrinkage okay and the, but different shrinkage so it's it is complicated uh, then low shrinkage is going to be bisqueware or calcine kaolin which another name which you can purchase calcine kaolin is called Glomax. So those all have low shrinkage. What they've done is fired the clay. Uh, so, and I've shown this down here. So here's a clay molecule. It's uh, Al2O32SiO2. And then it has water, like five water associated with it. And what happens, that material has properties like um, is plasticity, which is shrinkage. But when you heat it up, you're going to drive that water off. And when that water goes off, you've created ceramic or bisqueware. And that material th has no shrinkage. And so that's what we're talking about. When we have a high shrinkage material, kaolin, and we bisque fire it, it becomes ceramic. Uh, and that's two ways to make up a slip. Okay, or two materials that you could put in a slip. All right, so let me do one more, and that is about uh, um, clay, how clay bodies are represented. So here is a, uh, a representation of clay body. You usually say clay, flux, and filler. 
Okay, but today we're going to mainly talk about clay and flux uh, and kind of leave out the filler. And then glazes, when I talk about glazes, the way we look at glazes is it's flux, refractory, and glass former. And so today we're not really going to talk much about the glass former part, but we'll talk about the flux and the... Um, the refractory or the kaolin or the alumina part. Now, <clears throat> you can get alumina from other sources besides kaolin, but kaolin is kind of the most uh, uh, common source of alumina in glazes. Okay? So I might have done that okay. Uh, now, uh, also, I forgot to mention one other thing is I'm going to be doing this alone, and so I may have to move my camera a little bit. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is show how uh, on this continuum, this side is 100% kaolin and this side is 100% flux, namely uh, it, with slips you do kaolin and, and feldspar. So kaolin and neff size is what we'll concentrate on. And as I add more and more neff size or flux, it will move down the line here become more vitrified and finally become a glaze and then I'll show some glazes on the other end in reference to how much kaolin are in those recipes. So that may help you later when you look at recipes just to sort of see which, which slip is for bisque ware, which slip is for green ware, etc. Okay? <clears throat> now, the reason I'm doing this <laughs> is because when I start, well, first of all, it's for like a Zoom class for people uh, that I'm, uh, they've asked for it. But secondly, because when I started in glazes and clay, there, people would sling around this term slip all the time. And it was like super confusing to me, like, because I couldn't understand what they were talking about. So I made a list here of all the names I could think of off the top of my head of slip uh, names. So let me do this first. I'm going to move this a little closer and now I'm going to make sure we're at the right spot. Oops, I got to get my... Got to have glasses in this world. Okay. Oh, that's actually pretty good. Okay, so... What, what this is here is, these are the names of all the slips. So I'll try to describe them a little, but uh, you pretty much have to, it would be beyond the scope of this, you know, 30 minute talk here. But you can Google them and look them up and they're uh, pretty easy to find. So one would be called a thickened slip. So that's when people make up a slip very thick like it sounds uh, it's like frosting when they put make a plate or a vase and they put fro uh, the, like the frosting type thing on there and it retains its height after it's fired so Stephen Hill does a lot of this many many people use this technique another one is called trailing slip that's similar to that uh, but instead of using it with like a uh, you know, like a rib or something to put it on. You use a, a, a applicator like bottle and squirt it on, sort of like cake decorating. Uh, and, and, but it keeps its height after it's fired, so you can do a lot of decoration with it. And um, very similarly, I'm going to jump around here. Colored slip is in that version. They just add oxides and stains to slip, and oftentimes with uh, trailing slips, you can have a whole variety of colors that you're drawing with. Okay, flashing slip is a type of slip that they use in, and by they, I mean me, uh, the, uh, that they use in uh, soda firing and salt firing. And so I have some samples. Here's a sample of a flashing slip. You can see how this is kind of orangey here. So this is a wood fired piece with a like a bower flashing slip. And so when you have a <coughs> flashing slip, what you're after is a certain types of kaolin that will, when exposed to atmospheric conditions like in a wood kiln or a so soda or salt, will flash orange or some type of uh, burnt um, like color. So it could be 
terracotta looking or it could be uh, orangey like this. All right. And so another type of name of a slip might be an underglaze. So an underglaze is um, usually put on bisqueware. So that's another term here. Uh, and then joining slip. So a, a joining slip is when we connect things, usually we slip and score. And so we put some slip on there. So uh, uh, sometimes when they do a joining slip, you want it to connect well. So they'll either add like vinegar or uh, sodium silicate or um, sometimes a frit to help it bond a little better. So there's many ways to make joining slips. And uh, one of those is also called a stick up slip. And so that's what they use in industry to hook on handles and stuff. So I have um, a PDF on my website uh, called Should I Slip and Score? And I go into detail on uh, that type of thing. Um, so I can't really explain all this stuff right now. But anyway, there's another term called leather hard slip. Uh, and then greenware slip. So this refers back to those terms we were talking about. Uh, crackle slip. And I have an example of that. Crackle slip is can be put on either uh, greenware or bisqueware, but it, when it dries, it cracks a little. So it's a, a lot of times a relationship between the clay body shrinkage and the slip shrinkage. But here might be an example so that it cracks a little bit, or maybe here it's like some fine cracking. And um, okay, and then we have an on go which I'll talk about in a minute, and terra sigillata. That's like a, uh, well, that's a slip. Uh, it's uh, oftentimes put on like bone dry pottery, and they use it a lot in pit firing and stuff. And then you can get a veneer of color, uh, and then you can burnish it and make it look like it's shiny and make it be, look like kind of a glaze. Uh, casting slip, which is ubiquitous in ceramics it's how they make many many things uh, uh their slip cast and um uh industry uh there's a flocculated slip and deflocculated slip which i won't go into but i have a bunch of uh videos on on this channel uh flocculated slips how to how to change your slips flock and deflock Okay, and then um, slip glazes. Okay, slip glazes, it just means that the, um, the glaze has a high amount of slip, or in many cases that means earthenware clays. They call slip clays. Uh, and so it may have 50% red art in it, or 50% uh, albany. And so what happens with the rationale behind that is that earthenware clays will melt uh, as they get really hot. So you could have a high albany component in your glaze. And if you fired it low, it would be just a terracotta color. But as you got higher to cone 10, say, it would turn into a glaze. It completely melts and turns into a glaze. And they often use a lot of slip in ash glazes because originally glazes were sort of, I mean, discovered by, by in like wood type kilns when the ash hit the clay and it sort of melted a little. So then they started using uh, just clay and ash to make a glaze. Uh, and then the lower fire clays that you use would be called slip uh, clays. So Albany slip, Alberta slip, and Ohio slip. Okay, so now let's do a simple definition of slip. And that is just to mix clay with water. And we call that a slip. Uh, so oftentimes just in your, when you're making pottery, throwing pottery in the bucket or in the, uh, throwing wheel, there'll be watered down clay and that's called slip. Okay. I guess we could, uh, now start going, let's start going. Now all these 
This thing looks like super complicated, but it's really not. I just drew these up here so I could point out recipes as we were going and look at the clay component uh, in these recipes. All right. That's pretty good. Let's now, let's just start with uh, a flashing slip and what the amount of kaolin and uh, flux is in that. So right here we have uh, 70 kaolin, 30 nephsi. That is a flashing slip. Now you can vary the kaolin uh, with Helmar or Grolig or Tile 6 or something. In the old days we used Avery and that flashed a certain way so you can change the way it flashes and change maybe the type of flashing. But the idea is there's a lot of clay in there, 70%. So uh, when you put that on a, like a bisque pot, which will not shrink and the 70% clay is on there and it tries to shrink, it'll crack off. But People do this all the time when you do soda and salt firing. They'll bisque their work, take it over to a, somebody who has a salt kiln or a wood kiln, and they'll dip it in flashing slip. And then you're like, well, how is that working? Well, they do it very, very thin. And so you just quickly put in like skim milk. You make it up very thin and dip it in real quick. But if you put it in... Um, too long or too heavy of a coat, it, it cracks uh, and then flakes off. And so then that's bad. Okay, so then, okay, another slip that I was just mentioning was like slip that's in your bucket of your throwing bucket or your hand building bucket. So that could be, or that is the clay body that you're using. Now, all clay bodies have different formulas and different amounts of clay and flux. So this port, like if I had a Grolic porcelain slip, here would be the recipe. And so my amount of clay is uh, 55, and then my uh, amount of flux is 25. Okay, so just keep that in your mind. Now if I do stoneware, that's in my bucket, and I make a slip out of that, that's going to contain, like right here's about 90% clay in there. That's very high shrinkage when it's uh, fired. And then um, there's only about 8 to 12% feldspar or flux. Okay. And then another type of slip, which is the most extreme over here, would be terra sigillata. So terra sigillata is basically made up like... Here they have uh, 3,000 grams of water, that's a recipe for it, uh, and 1,500 grams of clay, so XX Sager or Red Art will make, XX Sager is a ball clay that will make it white, and uh, Red Art would be a earthenware clay that would make it a terracotta looking uh, terra sige. And then they put sodium silicate in it. So that thins everything out. So that deflocculates everything. All right. So traditionally, you would use terra sige on uh, uh, bone dry wear. So you would make something, let it get bone dry, paint on terra sige, uh, or dip it real quick, and then wait a little while. And then you can burnish it and make it shiny. And then sometimes they'll put another layer on and another layer. Okay, but you can put terra sige direct, directly on bisque wear. And so then you say, you say, how is that possible? Well, if you do it very thin, same way with this flashing slip. And so, uh, first of all, the sodium silicate will make it very thin just because it's deflocculating it. Uh, but you also dip it real quick. So I've glazed, this is a piece of porcelain that I made these ewers with and then I um, it's white but I dip this after it's bis fired real quick in a terra sige and it'll make it look burnt like that so there's a lot of possibilities if you can understand uh, why things work it's very helpful okay so I did that I'm going to come back to this this go hondo and crackle slip a bit later all right so now let's talk about uh let me see if i can see this middle of this board before i continue okay yeah yeah 
Fantastic. Um, all right, so right here we ha let's go. Let's just go to the center right now and say um, what we've got here is 50-50. So I have 50 kalin and 50 nephsi. That's what we call an ongobe or a vitreous slip. So ongobe is French for vitreous slip. And as far as this continuum goes, that's halfway in between a total clay slip and a glaze, a runny glaze. So 50-50, so it's on the way to becoming a glaze. And so it's on the way to becoming vitrified. So it's a vitrified slip. And what it'll be, instead of being like shiny, it'll be like a satiny surface instead of being, you know, like a, a slip itself would be pretty matte. And then this is on the way to becoming a glaze. Okay? All right, so then we'll go to the back a little bit to the leather hard slip. And so that's like 60 kalin, 40 nephsi or flux. And that's still a lot of clay, 60. But of course, you know, it's less than, you know, here where it's 80 and 90%. So you, you put it on leather hard clay. Uh, and it's, you know, you can do a lot of decorating before you bisque fire it. That's the, uh, that's the idea. Okay. So then we're going to move over to, um, an underglaze would be here. So this is an underglaze and that means it's going to go on bisque ware. And so it's, you, you have to think in your mind, okay, bisque is not shrinking. So if I'm putting a slip on there, it can't uh, have a lot of shrinkage or it'll crack off. So you can see here that there'll be like 40% clay in here and 60% of flux or other ingredients. So here's a recipe for a slip. And, and those are in my mid-range book in the back. I have these recipes. So this is a Kaolin and ball clay, 20 and 20, so that's 40. And Kaolin is just whiter than ball clay. Uh, and then, like there, this is another one which is a little bit in between. This has 50 Kaolin and ball clay. So you add those two up. All right, and then, let, I think you can still see, but let me, I'm gonna move this camera a little bit. So we get a little bit over here and of course I have to check it. Okay. I think that's good. Okay. So now we are into the, if I see now this recipe here is going to be an underglaze, then I can immediately know that either by how much clay is in there. So in this case, a lot of times 40% versus 70 or 80. And this has calcine kaolin. So what people do a lot of times, and a lot of these gla clays and slips and glazes have all evolved over the years. So when you start out in pottery, you're just sort of jumping in and midstream. But somebody would have a slip, and then they would notice it's flaking off. So they would take their clay component, say it was 40%, they just calcine half of it. So that cuts the shrinkage of half of that clay. So now they only have 20% of the clay that's plastic and shrinks and 20% is uh, like bisque or non-shrinking. And so then that would work and then that's how these all evolved. So like if you look at this VC2 slip recipe, it has 20 kaolin and 15 calcine kaolin. So that's 35% clay component but only 20% is plastic so I know immediately that's for bisque wear. or here's another one cats on go this one if you look at it it has 12 kaolin a three ball clay so that's 15 and then calcine kaolin 15 so that's an example like I just said where they had a recipe just split the kaolin in half the calcine half stuck it back in and they're good to go all right, so I think we're doing, I feel like we're doing good here. Um, now we're going to get a little more into the glaze uh, side of things. 
So as we have less and less alumina or kaolin, we are going to, to move uh, to, to more runny things. Um, and so all these are going to be a discussion of how much clay is in a glaze recipe. Now, you know, I'm simplifying this a lot to, to just get the basic idea of things. But, you know, glazes are not just made up of nephsi or feldspar as a flux component. They'll have dolomite and whiting, uh, fritz, all kinds of things in them to help things melt. And for different reasons, um, you know, to either make uh, things brighter or make things matte, etc. All right. So right here, which is uh, kind of my favorite one, because it's the opposite of a flashing slip. A flashing slip is 70 kaolin, 30 nephsi. And this is the reverse. It's 70 nephsi, 30 kaolin to make a chino glaze. All right. Now, just like I said, I'm simplifying these things. You could spend... I've, I've wrote many, I've written many PDFs on uh, chinos because they're uh, very simple but complex. So it doesn't have to be 70, 30. It could be, it could be 90, 10, 80, 20, 60, 40, like that. And then uh, uh, chinos will use a variety of feldspar. So they won't just use nephsi. They'll use um, spodumene and um, soda feldspar like minspar and, and nephsi so they, they have three feldspars and then they'll do them in different percentages and then for the kaolin component they may use uh, kaolin if they want it whiter or ball clay if they want more iron or they could use earthenware clay so all this but this just gives you a general idea of a chino recipe 70 30 all right, and then as we move down in our kaolin component to 25%, if there's 25% clay in a glaze, that's a fair amount. Uh, and that's a typical thing would be a, 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 a matte glaze, like Rhodes 32. This is a typical high uh, kaolin uh, glaze. You see it has 25 kaolin and then the other fluxes in there. Okay, now if I move down a little further, less kaolin as we're going, you'll come to celadons. So celadons will have like 20% kaolin in them. And then if you keep going down, you're going to run into uh, copper reds. These are like 5% five, uh, 5 kaolin, maybe 10, 10, 5 to 10, maybe even less. But they want less alumina in the glaze it makes it brighter the more alumina you have in the glaze the more dull the glaze can become so copper reds want to be very bright so there'll be low alumina glazes and then the final one here with almost no kaolin or alumina is crystalline glazes typically it might have one percent in there all right so what I try to get people to do are starting out. Now, of course, you know, there's many aspects of glaze. You can be very complex and scientific, or you can be, you know, a beginner starting out. And one easy way for a beginner is to just go through the book and look at the how much kaolin is in all the recipes. And that helps you get an understanding for uh, glazes and glaze types. All right. I'm pretty sure we did everything. Now I want to tell you one more thing, and that is, um, let me make sure that we're seeing that. Okay. Yep. So I'm going to do one more thing, and that is the sort of culmination of all this. And um, if I have a flashing slip here, that is 70 kaolin, a uh, 30 nephsi. So that's a lot of clay. Now, I can put that on usually greenware, some kind of le uh, leather hard or bone dry type uh, material. It's very good. But I can also put it on bisque, very thin. Now, gohondo is a type of slip that's like this. This is a gohondo uh, type of bowl it's a spotty effect i wrote a, a pdf on this 
Okay, so that slip, you can see, is a, essentially can be this one recipe. Of course, there's many recipes, but this one recipe is identical to the flashing slip. And you can see the propensity uh, for the, like the orangey stuff, but just slightly different than this one. Okay, so, so that explains that. But now, Gohondo slip is put on greenware. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, it's put on greenware, on leather, usually leather hard. So that bowl has a lot of shrinkage. So if I put that on, sometimes it'll, it can flake off. But in order to make it not flake off, we add bentonite, which is a high shrinkage clay. So it will shrink along with the bowl that I've made and will be fine. Okay? So, and then here's a crackle slip. Uh, the reason I put this in here was to show you how they use a similar technique for the... Uh, the underglaze over here, the underglaze recipes use calcine kaolin. They'll do the same thing. So in this case, the clay component here is kaolin 15, ball clay 15, that's 30, and Glomax 20. So 50% um, kaolin might crack off too much. So it's going to crack, they'll all crackle but uh, it might crack and fall off. So in order to stop that on whoever made this recipe, they added, uh, they calcined some of it. So in this case, they did 20% that they calcined, and then that fit really good. Okay? I think I might have done it. All right, well, you should now make up all these recipes tonight. And put them on pots tomorrow and let me know how it goes. Mm -hmm.